Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. And I'll thank you all for being here. This is great. We, you know, we really did have hopes for meeting together, but then there are people that said, gosh, could we do it both ways so that if I'm and away from home, I could get on. So who knows? We'll, we'll, we'll figure that out someday. Uh, I am Sarah Kessinger, president of the Sterling Society, and I welcome you all and thank you for coming to this Zoom meeting. Um, a couple of, of events are coming up, so I always have to do some shameless uh, you know, advertising. So we're uh, presenting astronaut Nicole Stutt as our speaker for the Sterling uh, High Tea on Saturday, October the 2nd. It will be our first event of our new year. We're on an October year. So she, that will be, she'll be kicking off for us. And at this point, it's almost at capacity. It's amazing. Uh, Nicole is not only an astronaut, but she's also an artist and an author. And what they, I believe that's three A's, astronaut. Yeah, it is, artist and author. Uh, she is really an amazing lady. I had lunch with her with Sid Intel and Carol Bickford, two other people on, that are that our two co-chairs that are doing the uh, doing the high tea. And she is just amazing and will answer any question. I bar none. She will answer anything that you ask. So it's really kind of fun. Uh, our next event after that will be December the 17th. Uh, cocktails and candy canes. We had our first one last year with that name, and it was fun. Uh, we we laughed because last year we were uh, we wanted to give everybody a, a, a cocktail for the holiday, and so we had a little pre cocktail party, and we said, "Whoa, nobody drives home." <laughs> uh, a great gathering uh, will be to start off all the holidays, and and everyone has some type of holiday. Uh, I would also like to thank our Coffee and Conversation sponsor, Diane Wheatley Gelati. Uh, we do appreciate what she has done. She has given us a, a major sponsorship for this, and it makes it possible for us to present it uh, in, in, uh, in Zoom and makes it, it makes it possible to present this free to all of our Sterling members. And when we're back together, there is a nominal fee for people that are not members of the Sterling Society. But her, uh, her sponsorship defrays the cost of presenting this in Zoom format. So that has been a, just a godsend to us. Don't know that we could have done it. Um, Diane, Diane Gelati has been involved with uh, DFAC for many, many years and has certainly made a difference. She, uh, she's done it in, in many, many ways, including the sponsorship. She was also instrumental in the formation of the Sterling Society back in 2004 and five. And Diane, we all thank you for doing this, everyone, including the participants, thank her. Now, then we have another Diane, which you've already met. And this Diane uh, graciously has accepted um, being our host for the next year, starting in October. So to, today is her last day of this year. It's also Diane's last of her present uh, sponsorship, the other Diane, and she will. Uh, she has also sponsored for a new year. So this is it's a great way to start off for us. We were hoping to be able to do it in person. That didn't happen, but hey, we are all capable of, of uh, moving right along. So Diane, you do a great job and I thank you very much and I turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Diane Van Dusen. I know a lot of you have attended past Zooms and know who I am. I'm a member of the Sterling Society. So um, my role is lining up the artists with much, much help from Catherine Bergman and Nathan, uh, the curator, assistant curators at the Art Center. And I, I'm sorry to say that I don't have a lineup for the rest of the year, but I'm getting on it. But um, I'm just going to go through the logistics for those of you who haven't attended one of these. The chat icon at the bottom in my screen, the bottom of my screen, um, I ask that you use that as questions come up throughout the presentation. Um, but if it's an urgent, like you have to have the answer right then, you can raise your hand. There's a little icon at the bottom that shows a hand and unmute yourself and your hand will show up in your photo. But um, I will follow the chat throughout and see what the questions are and kind of make a judgment call as to whether it can wait to the Q&A at the end. Um, depending on what kind of device you have, in order to hear this presentation um, in its best volume, make sure your volume on your device is set to whatever level is comfort for you. And make sure you stay muted during the presentation because we don't want to hear your dogs barking or a baby crying or whatever else might be going on. 
And I am going to let PA do her own intro of her bio and background. But I just want to briefly say that I only just met her. She came into the gift shop. I volunteered in the gift shop and she came in to buy something. And that was when I learned she was an artist and we chatted and she agreed to be our first presenter. And since that time, I've gotten to know her personally, going out to her home to assist in putting together her slideshow. And this is a very, very powerful presentation. Um, I get emotional just thinking about it because it is an amazing presentation. So I'm gonna let PA come on and introduce herself, her art. And, but I will mention one thing that she probably won't mention in her own introduction. She also was on the board of DFAC at one time. Uh, but she's gonna give us her art background and life background, but uh, she was on the board and has known George Ann and many of the people at the Art Center for years. So having said that, I hope PA and Nathan is there to assist her with any technical things. They're at the Art Center. I hope they're ready to come on and I'm gonna close my mouth and just kind of watch how many more people keep signing on and welcome PA. Well, I have to tell you, I'm very, very honored and it's such a privilege to, to be here today with all of you. I have a long history, which Diane mentioned with the Art Center and a um, great deal of support from the Art Center through the years. So it's, it's an honor and privilege. And I have to thank Catherine Bergman and Nathan very much so. I have a, uh, a solo show in the Gamble Gallery that is coinciding with this talk. It will open with uh, four other fabulous, and I'm telling you, I, again, honored four other fabulous shows that are coinciding at the Art Center and, and they're opening this Friday, the 17th, and uh, we'll go through December, but we're open Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. right now. And uh, it, it's just, you know, thank you, Gail and Chip Gamble for that gallery. Um, so many of the people in the Sterling Society, I thank you for the support and, um, Diane, for her patience and tender caring to teach me some technical skills, come over to my home, spend lots of time, get to know her, and I appreciated that. And I have to say something about George Ann. George Ann, thank you for always, always saying yes to me. Thank you. Um, I am PA and Kushner, and I'm from Buffalo, New York, originally. I've been in this area 40 plus years. I started my art education at University of Buffalo uh, and actually got my BFA down here at uh, USF. Um, I had a lot in between those two times. Uh, I started as a painter and a sculptor and I went back and forth and back and forth. And um, I've, I've really, really resonated with sculpting, although I paint some of my sculptures too. Can we go to um, the name of the show that's going to be presenting and this talk today is now and then. And it's really over a period of 14 years of my work. And uh, I'm gonna talk about process and narrative. And um, I, I wanna mention again that this show is up this Friday, which is September 17th. And um, it's part of the autumn 2021 show with four other fabulous shows coinciding. Um, the now and then is going to be explained throughout the slideshow, but what I'm going to concentrate today is on the process and the narrative. Um, slide one, please. Um, we're, um, in my past, the way we sculpted in clay, well, I sculpted in, in clay and stone and wire and, and metal. I welded when I was at USF. And about, oh, I'd say 15, 14 years ago, I took a class at DFAC again, just for fun. And we were doing this clay and I fell in love. And I just, the tactile event of the clay was, was I was done. I was, I was married to it. And um, the way we used to do clay, uh, the way I was taught was solid. We would work in the round solid with an armature and um, the piece would be worked as a whole, the same way my paintings were done. 
that at any point your painting could be finished. Um, you'd have the expression of the, 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 what you were trying to do. And for me, often it was the figure. I was attracted to the figure. So about 14 years ago, I went out to Santa Fe for a workshop with Esther Shimazu, who's a uh, Japanese American. She lives in Hawaii and she worked with the figure as a vessel. She did not work solid. She worked uh, hollow, meaning with slab and coil and pinching the way we hand build. And um, she would build the body as a component part and um, it would be modular. So you would build the trunk maybe in two or three different pieces and then add shoulders, arms, you know, and the arm would be in two sections. You would roll these tubes and push out and form the body. And this first piece is called a sauna ring. And it's about four feet high and four feet wide. It's very large. Um, I was enrolled at St. Pete College at that time with Kim Kirchman and Jonathan Barnes. And um, they're pretty much potters. I mean, they, they build vessels and you know, Kim gave me a great deal of latitude to work on what I was envisioning and I was doing the figure. So I, I worked this piece, I would care, I would get this back and forth from my house to the studio at school. And um, this, this is on a stainless uh, rod that has been fabricated in steel. And the hinges on the bottom, I'm calling them hinges, but they're not hinges, they're boat hardware. It fits in there and that comes out. That's how it becomes portable. That piece, the wood is about 40 pounds of cypress block on the bottom. So um, I wasn't always taking that back and forth, but I was taking the ring. Each of these pieces were made uh, one at a time. And it is the yoga poses to flow without the arms, the appendages and the legs other than the, the one. Um, and it's, it's just the flow, the continuum, and that's what's going on with this piece. So I had a lot of practice working hollow. This next piece, these next two pieces are totems, which I love working in, in the totem form. And again, it's the yoga poses, and I'm, I'm learning to get the gesture. I'm, I'm, I'm working hard to get different form negative, positive space working together and many different firings. You'll see uh, soda firings in these and you'll see low fires and you'll see sagger fires. And, you know, we were, we were just doing a lot of different thing, even raccoons. But both of these um, were again, a lot of practice. And then I moved to, uh, this is a piece I just loved. I, I just, it, it exemplified what I'm trying to tell you. This was a hand-built pot. It is not a thrown pot. And it was a thinly laid slab that I pulled out from the inside to create that form. And then each of the tubes, the same thing. And there's a little bit of slip on them. And um, the, it's just a beautiful soda fire. Let me say that. They were all fired in different parts of the kiln. That's why we have the variation. and. It just, I just really loved the way this came out of the kiln. And I neglectfully, when house cleaning, never house clean, it's not a good thing. I was vacuuming, I hit the table and, and this poor piece hit the ground and that was it, it broke. So I, I lost this piece. Um, this next piece is called Tipping Point. And um, it's the first time I did a full figure. And of course you can see I brought in the totem form it's on the block of Cyprus again, and it starts with a block of cheese, Swiss cheese and, and another block. And um, this figure is hollow and she was built in that component way that I'm telling you, other than the feet, which I built the feet solid and then I slice them and I hollow them out and I gesture them and then reattach them. Uh, the nice thing about this was, <sighs> You know, I was working everything as a whole, and I believe that's still a great thing. But this style of working, I could cut an arm off very easily and reposition it at an elbow, at a shoulder, at a hand. I, I can change the form of what it's doing. And this 
this has a bio with it that I'd like to read to you because it's a, it's a little bit more complicated than just me, me saying a few words. In Tipping Point, a wedge of Swiss cheese acts as the precursor to tip a neutrally stylized figure off the safety of her block while sliding down a cloth of jagged glass. Removal of the hula hoop and ride em cowboy announces the changes and O is the first choice. Decals and words are added as polarities to continue the juxtapose of communication. With form and gesture, I create a tension of push and pull to move through space, challenging gravity as part of my composition. I use not only positive space, but also negative space to create balance of design. Transformation of form, surface icons, and movement itself all illustrate the ride. The invented narrative is an example of what change may look like in a pretend world. And um, some of the words that are on it on the block are point of departure. So I knew something was changing in my world. I just didn't know what. And I offer that information not to have you as an observer have to agree always with my narrative because I, I really want people to come to my work and see what they want to see from it. But I'm going to give you a little bit of information so that when you do look at the work, you have some idea of what's going on uh, and then can take it from there. This next piece is called Leggy. And um, she has three legs and she has decals on her that are poppies and uh, dandelion. And she sits on a platform that is from photos of my parents and my grandparents from pretty much the 1940s. And what we did was we set her on these photographs that were done with Ciba chrome decals and then fired them on the clay tiles that are below her. And it's about uh, my own sexuality. And, it, and it's not meant as anything negative towards anything. It's just that how it was and what I was and the differences of the time. The next piece, um, this is Hear Me Roar. And um, she's kind of a favorite because she's got my girl's head on her. Uh, this piece again is hollow. She's on a velvet pillow and that head is removable. She is a reliquary. And a reliquary is a holder of sacred items. And inside, if the head is removable, it comes off. Inside are scrolls of uh, stories from the newspaper of abuse towards women and children. And one of the stories that are in there from Laura Logan back in 2011, she uh, was a CBS reporter and she was in Egypt and she was horrifically raped by a crowd of men in Egypt. And she was beaten and it was, it, it was hor horrifying. Um, the women, the only way she survived was the women of Egypt surrounded her around a wall and uh, blocked off the men from getting to her. And this was on 60 Minutes. Um, so it was a big story, but from, from Hear Me Roar point of view, um, it's for women and children, those that cannot protect themselves for various reasons. And uh, a funny story about this, I met up with uh, Esther Shimazu for NSICA, which is the uh, National um, Council of Education for Ceramic Arts in Tampa in 2000, I think it was in 2010. And um, she was one of the demonstrating artists. It's a very, very big trade show for, for clay artists. And um, everybody and any, anybody that has anything to do with clay or sculpture usually comes to this. And she's one of the demonstrating artists. And uh, she got in touch with me because she knew I lived in the area. And she was going to stay with me. And we both ended up staying in Tampa because they start at 8 a.m. But we had dinner together and Kim Kirchman was with me and Marjorie Green from uh, St. Pete College and we're all sitting around having dinner and I think a few other people. And I was, I was 
real proud to show Esther this piece, you know, so I'm showing her some photos of it in my phone. And she, I said, it's called Hear Me Roar. And Esther looks at me and she goes, dogs don't roar. <laughs> and I just went, oh, okay. You know, you have to, when you're an artist, you know, I mean, I, I wasn't taking those words literal like she did, um, but she did. And, you know, you have to be ready to have things said. And I just, I just laughed and I said, I guess you're right. And uh, so that's funny. But anyway, I did not rename her. I still think she's Hear Me Roar. Uh, next piece is Blah, Blah, Blah. And this piece uh, is simply about getting on the soapbox, getting on your podium. You know, in the 1800s in Britain, people used to go to the town square and they would have a, um, a podium or a box, they would stand up and they would sell their wares or their political beliefs or whatever. And um, a crowd would join around them. And uh, this, this blue man is blah, 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 is representing kind of that, that thought. And Jonathan built the podium, the little stand that he's on for me. And, and I have to have a side note for Jonathan Burns. You know, I was, and Kim, uh, I was always coming up with new things and different things that I wanted to do. I, I envisioned my pieces pretty much wholly in my, in my mind's eye before I build them. And then I have to figure out how to do it. And I was always going to Jonathan and saying, how do I do this and how do I do that? And this piece is airbrushed. And I started airbrushing when I was in high school, but I didn't know I could under I, I could airbrush glaze. So we got that whole setup going and he worked with me on that. And I airbrush a lot now. I love it. And um, the 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 piece next to it is in greenware for people that may not be aware of how this goes. That's the clay before it's bisque fired. And I have these feelings about clay. When I'm in the greenware state, the wet state of the clay, I feel it's alive and it's wonderful and I'm very excited and I'm feeling it. And then I bisque fire it and it kind of dies. It gets hard, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't have that alive look. And then you add your glazes and your finishing touches and it comes back alive to life again. The, um, the little rhinestones on the slippers are, I'm now starting to think about things like adornments, which are really fun. And I, I love that, the, the after effects after the firing. Uh -oh. Thank you. Um, this one is called My Bad. And um, it's regarding words and expressions in modern day language. Um, my son, my oldest son, Logan, posed for this. And um, there's a lot going on here. Um, there's decals, there's gold luster, there's red flocking for the yarmulke. Uh, and I'm gonna read you a little bit about the bio. In my bad, I reference good versus evil and the timelessness of that concept. Here, this contemporary psycho babble we still deal with in this ageless black and white answer. I did bad, but it's okay, no big deal, get over it. It's the self-righteous behavior that tells us it's okay. No skin off my back. I'm bad, not good, your problem. The blue and grayish background behind the Ming Dynasty scroll design and the lotus blossom decal represent the goodness of luck and happiness, also black and white concepts. The agelessness of, of ideas is only an interesting flux of words. Good versus evil from religious beliefs from yesterday and today are still related without really taking responsibility. And you can see the blue, that is a decal that I added and refired. And on the other side, it's carved out the form and there's a whole uh, tattoo up the back of this one. Go ahead.
that's a picture of my my oldest son Logan and uh, and Olivia, our Bouvier de Flanders. She she came to us on Logan's 18th birthday, and they became fast friends. Um, suddenly, in January of 2012, Logan passed away. He had an accident. Um, he he had been at Stetson University and was home for Christmas vacation, and um, we had had dinner with him, had a great night. He went out with friends and, and an accident occurred and, and pretty much our, our lives stopped and uh, pretty much blew up our family. Um, so now begins, now begins. I couldn't work for quite a while and um, I was at quite a loss, as you can imagine. Um, it was a very difficult time. And um, Logan had a, had a lot of community behind him, a lot of friendships. And um, the whole community actually came out and supported and was wonderful. And we, with, with Logan's friend's help, we formed the foundation on Logan at Foundation in memory of him. And um, we did that with the help of Pinellas Community Foundation and Julie Scales. After a little research, we found that was the best way for us to go. And Julie was the, the person in the beginning that really held us hand to, to build this foundation. And what I do wanna say today is we have donated over a quarter million dollars because of the support from this community in memory of Logan to to youth in scholarships and, um, and JDRF, which is juvenile diabetes. And I wasn't able to do my own process right then, but um, what I was able to do was work with kids. And we got the juvenile, I was, the reason we picked juvenile diabetes, Logan was very involved. His, his one of his best friends, the family, their youngest son had juvenile diabetes and they were tremendously supportive in our foundation. And, you know, Logan used to park cars and help out in any way with their fundraiser. And um, that's how juvenile diabetes came into our, our donation uh, uh, revenue area, whatever. Um, and what, what I did was I asked George Ann, this is one of the times I asked George Ann, can I use your studio? And she said, yes, absolutely no questions asked. She just said, yes, I told her what was going on. She was delighted. And we brought kids in that had juvenile diabetes to make this bowl. And each of them got a slab or two and were able to put in the slab in their own words or in their own picture, some feelings they had towards having this disease. And then we formed it in the bowl with the cheesecloth. The bowl there is a, a mold. And um, it got green, greenware harder, leather hard. And I took it then to St. Pete College where I asked Kim, can we fire this? And she said, yes. So we fired it and we used oxides to stain it. And then we returned it to juvenile diabetes and they used it in their fundraiser, their annual fundraiser and uh, auctioned it off. And it was, it was just a great tribute to the kids and felt very good. Also during this time, it was about a period of three years, I wasn't able to do my own work. Um, and I was struggling. I, I was really struggling. I, I, I met Dolores Mortimer at home, House of Mercy and Encouragement. And um, she had also lost her son and nephew. So it was really great for me to meet her. And she's a therapist. And she said, PA, I want you to work with the kids here. I want you to teach the kids art. And I want to observe them. She worked with kids. A lot of them had Asperger's or were on the spectrum. So I had the opportunity for about a year and a half to create, um, a, it, it would be about six weeks with these kids. And Olivia got service trained because of this, and uh, the, my dog. And she came in with us and we worked in a small room with about six kids and we'd have art projects and we would work with them. 
And Dolores was able to observe them in a, in a social setting rather than just one-on-one. -on -one. And it was very, I think it was enlightening for her and it was absolutely healing for me to be with the children. The first piece that I was able to make after all of this was, like I said, about three years later, and this is called The Gift. Um, I saw it two weeks after Logan had passed away in my, in my mind, and I tried to make it, but I was unable to. I had no, uh, no eye-hand coordination. It was like, um, I had never done art before in my life, and it was a very cruel thing for me. Um, so when this happened, I I sat down one day. You know, I had been I had been back at school, and I'd been making cups and saucers, whole, you know, kind of half-assed to be honest with you. I I wasn't really able to do very much, but one day it happened that I I I came back. I don't know. And the gift is exactly as I saw it two weeks after Logan. And um, it's, it's about, um, well, I'll just read it. And, and I want to share this part with you because there's so many of us that have lost people and really, really have gone through the grief and continue to go through the grief. This piece has been created for the healing of those of us who have experienced extreme loss. At some point, we begin to look back, not always with pain of what we have lost, but with the joy and appreciation for that life we have shared. We hold it to us with the protection of love and memory that is forever ours. And this is a close up of it. Next piece is keep praying. Um, this is a return to working solid. I, I knew the piece I wanted to create and I was on my way to a workshop in Santa Fe. Again, I, I went out to Santa Fe a lot and I, I worked with some of the most wonderful, talented ceramic artists in the country. And um, this, this person that I was working with, Alessandro Gallo. He's Italian. He's married to Beth Kavanagh Stitchner. And um, if you look at ceramic art, you'll probably know one or both of them. And this was created solid. And uh, I had all my drawings. I had my references with me. I knew what I was going to build. But um, my one of my cohorts and I, we were going to print things out at a, at a speedy print or one of those places. And uh, I needed more on the anatomy of this pose. This is the Malasana pose with yoga. And that is my body. And my friend photographed, he must have taken 30 photographs of me in the round to, for this piece. And um, those are my sneakers, those are my pants, those are, that is my body. And um, what I did is I, I did it there. I, cut it in half and quarters and legs and all that and hollowed it out, re reattached everything, fired it. The first firing was in Santa Fe. They sent it home and I finished it at home and it is, it is done with wall paint, believe it or not, the finish on it. There, there is no glaze, it's all wall paint. And uh, just, you know, like bare wall paint from Home Depot and, um, the antennae are copper wire, and it's called Keep Praying, even when you think no one is listening. This next piece is called Wisdom Woman, and um, it was created combining many women that I have in my life and have had in my life. It's uh, a lot of adornments. So you know that makes me happy. I love to, to add stuff. I love fabric and jewelry and I've got I've got feathers and I've got yarn and ribbon and you know just I had a lot of fun with this piece. I, I love the don't get me wrong, I love the clay part too, but this is also in the red clay. I'm now working in red clay uh, entering that stage from the white stoneware. And one of the other things I like about red clay is it can show through. 
And you don't have to always have every inch of red clay covered because the red clay is so rich in itself. Um, this piece has been refinished and refinished several different ways. It's been fired with glazes and then had paint on top. And, and just to get to the point where it is today, um, I, I sometimes I keep working a piece just because it's around. But the, the big story of it is that there are about 20 pieces of hair from 20 different women that I was very fond of. And I put their locks in her hair to create this piece. And it's about the wisdom of that group of people. And also the inscription reads, when the Japanese men broken objects, they fill them with gold. They believe that when something suffered damage and has a history, it becomes more beautiful. And the author is unknown. Um, I just really like doing this piece. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. My, my friends enjoyed it. Uh, they, they love being a part of it. And um, that's all I can say. This piece is out in Santa Fe Clay with, with Christina Cordova. And um, she works out of Penland in North Carolina. And she's very, very good on anatomy and focus very much on anatomy. So um, we were doing under glaze decals there. You can see the red clay, the richness of it. And um, we didn't have models, so we had to kind of find reference and from our own mind, create a pose or a person. And um, it, it was just, I learned so much from her. I, I really thought she was a fabulous teacher and a fabulous artist. This next piece has been shown at the Art Center. Um, it's, it's called Birds of a Feather, and it's a return to the totem. Uh, you see the male and fig, the female figure, and they're, they're reaching towards each other, pulling each other, you know, their energy towards. And um, I've got adornments here also. Um, it's, it's just, was a piece, a modular piece that, you know, I had to do piece by piece by piece. And um, there's some maiolicas starting in this and the gold bluster is there, the firings and a lot of oxide stain. This is, um, this is a favorite piece. Uh, it's the Pearl Fisher. And I went to the opera. I like the opera very much. And I'm sitting at the Pearl Fisher and I'm enjoying the opera. But all I can think about is the title of the opera, the Pearl Fisher. And I'm getting the vision of this piece. And there's this older woman who's with this Victorian collar and, you know, again, some adornments and beautiful things there and uh, some surface on it, you know, to show some change in, in from smooth to, to fabric look. And I started adding the pearls because the pearls are the quintessential moments in life. They're, the, the, they're those moments that we know come fleeting, but if we're conscious and aware, we know how important they are. And we know we'll always remember them. And there's some big pearls and there's some little pearls but, uh, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, that's pretty tedious to put all those pearls on there. And, you know, it's, it was not. It was, it was so happy to put those pearls there. Um, and actually, I put some more on this summer <laughs> before the show. So anyway, um, this is the Pearl Fisher. The next piece is called Absolution. And um, it's, a, it's a female, my, my bodies are stylized. I, uh, you know, they're, they're gender specific, but they do, they do sometimes have reference to the opposite sex. So this female is, is sometimes a little masculine depending on how you look at her, but um, she's definitely female. She's dealing with the release from guilt, obligation, and punishment. Um, and she's again on a, on a beautiful velvet pillow. The 
this is what now there's two female figures and they're pulling away from one another and uh it's it's pretty much what it looks like. There's there's a dichotomy of of thought and pull and um, and who they are just by what they're wearing, how they're they're posing their bodies, um, it, you know, and and just just the age or the style. Um, the hat is flocked, the cowboy hat is flocked. The stick I found on the north end of Honeymoon uh, Beach. And I knew when I picked that stick up, I started forming this piece. And um, I think I have a, a little bit of a, there, details. Um, you can see that they're, they're very different people. The one in orange, there's my new pup, that's Polo. I got Polo for Olivia so she'd have a puppy. And um, Polo starts entering my work a little bit playfully. He's got a little pink tongue and uh, he's, he's the, not the hair, but kind of where the hair would be on what now. What now is kind of like in my personal life, I was going, okay, what now? You know, what now? And within probably four or five months of doing this piece, well, it was longer than that. It was longer than that because I had shown this piece. Um, the next year we had COVID and life really changed for us. This piece is, uh, COVID has started and I no longer can fire work at, at St. Pete College because the school's closed down and it's, it's spring and it's not gonna be open till the fall. And I started texting with Jonathan, you know, what am I going to do? And we decided I should get a kiln. So we started texting back and forth and figuring it out. And I, I got the most beautiful Scott kiln in my garage now. And I have total freedom to fire my work as I want, when I want, which is, you know, St. Pete College was always great, but this is, this is a lot better. I'm not transporting wet clay back and forth. And um, this piece is called uh emergence and the way i formed it it's an architectural piece it, it hangs on the wall i'm i'm trying to move off the pedestal or the table because not everybody has room in their house for sculpture to sit on a table so i wanted to get it on the wall and um, i went to another workshop in Toto santos in the baja with patrick doherty and lisa clegg and uh, deborah fritz were all there and um, Patrick Doherty is an architectural ceramic artist. And he was teaching us how to build these large uh, molds and you know, to make sculpture for the wall. And it was, it was a great, great workshop. That's all I can say. Um, so the way this was formed, there's a big sphere in the middle. And I then built the bust, the head without the antlers by itself in the round and then cut the back of the head off to form the sphere of the circle and reattached it and cut out the back and then built the horns. Those are, those are clay built and there's some slip casting in there and, and the birds were added later and there's a lot of found objects in there. And I'm getting a little looser with my glazes. I'm, I'm dripping and, uh, and drizzling maolicas and I'm wiping and I'm doing some different things now. This piece is uh, definitely of our times. The hug was here uh, not too long ago for the, the member show. And um, the hug is for COVID. You know, I, I live alone with my dogs and I don't know about you, but I hug everybody I see usually. And, you know, we're not doing that right now and haven't for a while. And um, I, I wanted to do a piece that represented the tenderness of what it feels like to be able to hug another human being. And uh, of course the red rose is love. And uh, I had a couple ideas about what to stick in that hole. I knew I wanted to put something there, but I wasn't sure. And uh, I didn't decide until it went into the show. Uh, what to put there. 
But anyway, it ended up being the red rose and perfect representation for me because I had been in Spain right before COVID. And um, there was a square where they talked about love and red roses were always brought. And, you know, once a year they had this whole affair about a couple and on a balcony and everything. And I don't know, it just seems so appropriate. The scale in between is the I'm balanced between these two things. The other piece is called I'm right. And they have bathing caps on sort of. I swim. I, you know, sometimes I do things just because it's fun. And um, the, the red one is flocked. It's a, it's a felting that you add after firing. And um, the other one is maolica glazes and, and, um, and stains and things like that. Um, it's called I'm Right. And, and a lot of that happened in the past few years of, you know, people were separating themselves from pe other people because they felt they had to have the right answer and be right. And um, that hurt me. That hurt me. Um, I just, I just felt that the two together kind of show the dichotomy of of what what's happened and and what can happen. And um, anyway, it's it's they don't ha they don't go together, you know. They don't have to be rehomed together or anything like that. But I like showing them together. This piece is called Southern Beast, and it really originated from a dream I had. Um, well before Logan passed away and before I had, before either of these dogs, the dog on, on the head again is Polo, the little white one, and Olivia is the big black one. Um, neither one of these dogs were born at this time when I had the stream and I was walking in a park that I, I, di I, I didn't even know existed. So I made this piece in honor of that dream uh, and it's just my southern beast, you know. And there they are, the kids. This next piece is called Brave and Glorious Thing. Um, she is about two and a half. Well, she's she's probably almost three feet tall, and uh, with with the the wood armature she's, she's sitting on or standing on, hanging on. And I had her totally envisioned also before I made her, the only thing that was added later were the, the flowers on her head. And um, she's just a brave and glorious thing. She's a woman, she's clinging, you know, clutching her breasts and totally exposed and, um, and the strength that you see with her. She's got a mask that's similar to an owl mask. Um, and in the story behind her, she came about um, from my mind, but a friend of mine that I had been, I had been on a couple of these trips with, she's much younger than I am, she's in her 30s, uh, contacted me and she was in town and wanted to have dinner. So I met her for dinner in Safety Harbor and you know, we had a great time. It was like we were traveling again, you know, out eating and traveling and enjoying sights. And I said, do you want to come back to my home? I'd love you to see my home and meet the dogs and everything. And she did. And I said, would you pose for me? I have a piece in my mind and I, I need I need a model. And she said, sure. So she she hopped up on my kitchen table. We cleared everything off, put a sheet down and then she posed for me and I I just, it was great, you know, so anyway, she, she's, uh, there, was, there was a model, there's always a model, it's either myself or one of my friends. Um, this is my last piece, this is um, The Odor of Prayer, and she was in the kiln for the last time when uh, Nathan and Catherine were planning uh, to come over in a few days to put the show together now and then that's going to be here at Dunedin Fine Arts Center this Friday it starts uh, 2021 and um, she is uh, it's a woman's body and another friend modeled for it and um, she has a, a bird's head and the bouffant and the roses again are repeated and uh, the two adoring little birds next to her. And the title comes from Mary Oliver's poem. Um, 
it's an homage to Mary Oliver, her poem, Morning at Blackwater. Um, she, she often writes about the abundance of morning. And um, I'm a big believer in enjoying the morning. So anyway, this is just an appreciation for the abundance that we have. And I have to tell you, that's that. And I wanna thank you very, very much for staying with me if you were able to. Um, and if you have questions or comments, I'm happy to, to be here to learn from you. And um, I'll, I'll just turn it over and ask Diane to, to lead the way here. Thank you very much today to everybody, the Sterling Society and everyone. Thank you so much, PA. Um, I am surprised that there weren't any chat questions. Oh. And I don't know uh, if that's because people were just so mesmerized and listening, but I now see one popping up because I do know Julie Pals, Julie Graham Pals um, does work in clay. And so Julie, go ahead and unmute yourself. I saw it on chat, but just feel free to unmute yourself and pose your question. There she is. Julie is the uh, treasurer for the Sterling Society. And I know she has her own little woman cave studio that I haven't seen yet, but I'm eager to see. And she also helps the uh, clay studio at the art center. So go ahead, Julie, it's yours. I was curious, you said that you refired some pieces using, you know, after you put the decals and things on, what cone did you use? For decals, mm -hmm. I didn't refire them after decals. I thought you said to refire. There were some you said you refired, and I thought that well, was Well, I've refired things, but I go from high fire to low fire, whatever the highest temperature is to the lowest temperature. They would have burned off. Yeah, that's why I asked. Because yeah, I, I must have. I, I probably said it incorrectly or misleading. Um, right. You know, decals right. are very low fire, uh, probably about 1100, uh, 1060, something like that degrees. When we bisque, it's up to 1945. And, um, you know, the underglazes and the maolicas can all handle that fine. And then when I get to decals and, and lusters, it's much lower. And those are the last firing. Uh, yes. I might have been talking about uh, things like um, after firing, such as painting or adding adornments uh, and not set it well. So I apologize for that. No, no, I, I could have mis misheard. That's kind of caught my attention because I'd love to. And that's what I figured you do your final fire, then do something to it and put it in a low fire. Oh, that's what it was. The uh, pictures. You said something the about decals. Yes, yeah. the the pictures. What you had the one statue on of your family. Yeah, the first um, the leggy, leggy. Yes, well, leggy was separate and just sits on that uh, that platter, and um, so all the the glaze firing was done, and the last firing for that was to put those photographs back on, and okay. do the decal firing. All right, thank you. We have another yeah. question and Isabella Campolataro, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but please feel free to unmute yourself unless you'd prefer that I pose the question directly. Um, but it's it's basically asking about, um, was there a particular period of your creative career you most cherish? So um, Isabella, if you'd like to unmute yourself and pop up on the screen, uh, feel free to do so. Oh, and she also says, hi, hi, hello. 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 I don't know if you can see me. I'm sitting at my desk. Um, I can't see you so right now, today. but I can picture you. Hi. Hi. Uh, wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. And being walked through your work was a treat. So I just wonder if in your, in your, you know, in your lifetime career, creative career, if there's a time that you especially cherish or has special significance to you. And I'm going to turn off my camera to listen, if you don't mind. Thanks. Sure. You know, that's a great question. And, and why? Uh, and why? And, okay. and if there was one, why? Well, I have to tell you, when I was at the workshops in Santa Fe, I was really happy. I was really, really happy out there. Um, I think because I was, I had no attachment to anything. I had no responsibilities while I was there other than to work, to work, to listen, to, um, you know, I didn't even rent a car. I walked to the studio from the hotel. I worked 
from nine in the morning, sometimes through till eight o'clock at night. And um, we were just immersed in art. So I really, really like that time period and that experience. But I also want to tell you that as bad as COVID is, it was a great time for artists that were home working. And I know that from, from some of the people that I actually um, took these classes from and other artists I'm friends with, it was a very rich period. Um, I, I wasn't leaving the house and I didn't have to leave the house anymore. I had my kiln at home and I could just work and I had my dogs. And um, I, I guess I'm kind of a, um, what, what are those people called that stay alone a lot? I don't know. <laughs> I forget what they're called, but I, you know, I talked on the phone, I stay connected, I love my friends, I love people, but it was so nice to just be a little bit of a hermit, and, you know, this, this last couple of years, and, and the, the inspiring uh, of having this solo show here at Dunedin Fine Arts Center, which I cherish, you guys, I cherish Dunning and Fine Arts Center. I, I think the people and what they do here is tremendous. And I'm, you know, to say I'm complimented is not enough. It's just not enough. Uh, it was inspiring me to, to do more work and to really um, delve in. So thank you for asking, Isabella. It's a pleasure to see you and, and staying with me for this period of time. I have a question for you, PA. Yeah. Um, since I think from my understanding, almost all of your sculptures have come into being in your mind as almost fully formed visually. And do you ever wake up in the middle of the night with the image and actually feel compelled to start working on it right then? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're saying, am I um, obsessive? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm asking it because I tend to do that and I just wondered if, you know, when, when something comes so fully imagined and it's so detailed and there's so much going on, like the piece we're looking at right now. Yeah. I, I wonder how it stays in your mind until you actually get Well, there. you know, I, I used to be a drawer and a painter, mm -hmm. you know, and I didn't mention this, but I, I keep, I have too many journals, okay? Too many journals around the house, too many scrapbooks, whatever you want to call them. And th there's always one nearby. And um, what I do is as soon as I really feel I want to keep this is I scribble. I do not draw very appropriately anymore. I, I, the de I'm not a detail, I'm, when, I, when I'm putting these things down, I, I get a scribble idea down that's enough for me to remember what I need to remember. And then sometimes I write about it and I write about it a lot. And then I stop and I go back to sleep or I continue mm -hmm. doing what I'm doing because there are so much of the mathematics and I'm using that word very fluidly there mm -hmm. uh, to work out before I actually do the piece okay. um you know i i just i have to work out all the details of the how to this step that step this step but i will tell you as an artist and i think most of us online today are of an art background or an at least an art appreciate art appreciation background um there is a great fear of the white canvas you know before you start before you know what you're going to be doing and before you started, and can I do it? I mean, I still have this insecurity of, will I be able to make the piece that I'm seeing in my mind's eye? And then once I get started, it's like this takes over. And I, I think many of us can relate to this where you're so in the flow, you have no idea what time it is. Uh, you haven't eaten for hours and um, you know it just goes on. Um, so that's how I work. Sometimes I, had three or four pieces come to me at one time and I had to I had to get this stuff down because I didn't want to lose it and I can only make one piece at a time and mm -hmm. I'm kind of lazy I mean I work at, I pretty much work every day but it might be research it might be um you know just writing or or sketching out a particular thing or referencing I do a lot of referencing I mean 
But, um, you know, some days I'll work 10 hours, some days I can only work two hours on it. Yeah, my hands will get tired, whatever. So, um, but I am obsessive once I begin it. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's there's there. a couple other questions here on the chat. Um, so I'm gonna go to both names. One of them, Carol Eaton asks, um, in regards to keep praying, why did you use an insect's head on your body? I love all of your work. Thanks for this insightful presentation. So that's the one question. And then we have Kate Colgan, who is raised her hand, but I don't see her visually. So Kate Colgan also has a question. Um, I think I'm pronouncing the name right. So go ahead and unmute, both of you unmute yourselves if you want to be on the screen talking to PA, but PA, you could answer the first question about keep praying and why did you use the insect head? And I recognize okay. it as a praying mantis, so. Yes, yes. Um, Carol, thanks for, for, for asking and for your comments. Um, you know, I, Alessandro Gallo is somebody that works with the figures and puts an animal head often on his stylized figures. And um, he makes social commentary. So I'm going to this workshop and I'm thinking about keep praying and how I want to re represent that. And I knew about the Malasana and I immediately thought about the praying mantis would be a perfect head for that. It, it's as simple as that. So mm -hmm. I looked up tons of pictures of praying mantis. I actually found one and, you know, looked at it and, you know, that's how that happened. And okay. um, I hope that answers the question a little bit. And Kate Colgan, would you like to ask a question? Hey. Yeah, hi. Hi. So, uh, so, um, so my question is, do you ever keep in touch with uh, people after they've purchased um, some of your art? Uh, that's question number one. And question number two is, do you ever ask people to like, I guess this is more from when people go to the gallery, do they ever ask people like what, their interpretation might be when they look at it. Um, I think that would be interesting to do. I, I, I don't know. I'm just kind of throwing that out there okay. for engagement purposes because I think that that would be cool. And then that way you could look at it and uh, that type of thing. So, um, you know, people that have purchased my work in the past, um, do I keep in touch with them? Mm, sort of, not always, truthfully. Um, you know, I've been selling work for a while and um, I'd like to though, I'd certainly like to. Um, the second question about uh, the narrative of a piece, I, I write about this in my bio, I, I do have a narrative and that's what I was sharing in this talk today. There is a specific narrative, but I want to say to you, just like an author of a, a novel or something, you know, what you read into it is your business. I really do not intend to dictate what someone else sees when they look at my work. And I hope that they see what they want to see. And, you know, it's, it's iconic, iconographic um, realism. So there's a lot of symbiology in it, but, um, you know, it's really, I, I really want the freedom for people to see what they see. Great. Thank you. And one last question, and this will be from the, for the gallery as well, I guess, is that um, have you ever thought about making any of these into an NFT, which is called a non-fungible token? So I'm just going to open up that door and uh, that's it. I don't know what that is. I don't know that's what okay. that is. That's okay. I'll, I'll send you information. That's uh, I can tell you that Southbees just sold a, uh, a friend of mine uh, owns what's called a Board Ape Yacht Club. And it's it's digital image that can be secured on the blockchain. Oh, yeah. And so mm -hmm. for four million dollars, so it's a it, <laughs> yeah. it, it opens up a whole different thing. So I just mm -hmm. in, well, engagement. I I'm, like to I'm also gonna say that when I do the work, I'm not thinking about selling it so much. I'm thinking about doing it. Um, but I appreciate the marketing. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have a couple of other raised hands. So Sherry Lindeman, if you want to unmute yourself. And pose your question. I can see you on my little gallery view. So, hi there. And uh, you know, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to thank PA so much. You know, PA, I've been with you. You've been a great friend for many years. 
And um, so I've kind of been there sort of on the sidelines, just being able to hear about and watch you and your work. And I remember when you were thinking about whether or not you should go to Santa Fe. And, um, and then I remember how exuberant you were after you came back from there and what it meant for you. But um, this is truly, truly um, very inspiring work and very spiritual work. And I so appreciate you sharing it. So thank you. Thank you, hon. Thank you very much, Sherry. And I'm going to tell the audience that's still remaining that if you want to see this again and ponder it more at your leisure, these um, talks are always videoed, recorded, and they will end up on the DFAC website. At the top banner, there's a place that has Twitter and Facebook, and it has YouTube. And so there are many, many wonderful coffee and conversation um, programs that are you can go back and look at if you couldn't attend and uh, other things that the Art Center is doing uh, in the life of COVID. There's many other videos that we've been presenting. And so there's lots to see on the website um, if you wanna do a little trip down memory lane and look at it again. Um, right now, I don't see any other chats and I see a few people have dropped off with appointments, but every other chat that I saw that wasn't a question was just a huge thank you for a wonderful, inspiring presentation. And I don't know if George Ann wants to say anything at the end. I'm sure she's always promoting the Art Center and other things coming up. So go ahead, George Ann. Just want to say um, exactly what you said, um, Diane. Thank you, PA, for sharing your unbelievably beautiful and heartfelt sculptures. And we are so proud that we have you in our Gamble Gallery. And I have, we have loved your work forever. And it is just divine. And I wonder, are you ever going to teach? Um, Think about it. You would be an amazing and instructor at the Art Center. Absolutely. It's just, it actually brings <laughs> tears to my eyes. A lot of PA's work, it really does. Thank, Thank you, Thank you, George Ann. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, uh, the future programs are the second Tuesday of the month. I don't have the artists all finalized yet, but I've got a good list to work on. Um, I see another little question here from somebody. I think it's just, I admire and love PA with all my heart. So PA, um, I think you need to pop up with your contact info. I think the last slide was gonna have your website contact, but people can certainly just Google her name, PA Kushner. So if you wanna have further contact with her, I'm sure you can find her on the web. Um, so I don't know if Nathan or PA, if you did add a last slide. That well, we, we did not finish up with that last slide. Um, I have a website. It's PA Kushner, K-U-S-H-N-E-R, art.com. And you can contact me through there or the Art Center. Or through DFAC. Yes, yeah. for sure. So I'm just scrolling down. Okay, these are just, just ditto comments of, yes, I love the presentation. So there are no further questions, I believe. But if you do have further questions, you can contact PA personally, and I'm sure she'll respond. So with that, I think we're at, yeah, we're at about our time. It's 114. So unless anybody else has something they want to add or ask, I'm going to put end on my side, and that will end the presentation. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. And thank you, Nathan. I know you're in the background there, and you've been a very important part of this. So very much appreciate you being there on your end to help. I'll see you all next month, whoever's still signed on. Hopefully tell your friends about this awesome program, Coffee and Conversation, and I'll see some of you next month. All righty, bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.